I'm Sean Elliott. I'm a professor and surgeon in urology at the University of Minnesota. I specialize in taking care of the bladder health in people with spinal cord injury. A research group I'm involved in called the Neurogenic Bladder Research Group has done some great interactive work with people with spinal cord injury to try to understand what they want from the health system in order to improve their urinary quality of life. This video, in part, is a product of that feedback. If you or someone you care about has a spinal cord injury, recent or distant, my hope is that this video can help you understand, in plain English, how the spinal cord injury affects the bladder. There will be some follow-up videos on medical and surgical options to improve bladder health, but this video just focuses on how does the spinal cord injury affect the bladder. Let's start with a basic review of the relevant anatomy. At the top, we've got the brain. Signals travel to and from the brain via the spinal cord. The spinal cord has four regions, named after the vertebral bones that the nerves travel through. They are the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral spinal cord. There are eight cervical nerves, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and five sacral. A spinal cord injury is described by the nerve level at which it occurs. For example, a tetraplegic, otherwise known as a quadriplegic, could have a complete C5 injury, whereas a paraplegic might have a T6 injury. There are also differences based on whether the injury is complete or incomplete. People with an incomplete spinal cord injury will have more preserved function below the level of injury than people with a complete injury. We're going to focus on complete injuries here because the incompletes are a little more unpredictable as to their bladder function. Before we leave the anatomy slide, I want to point out that when it comes to bladder function and spinal cord injury, we can pretty much simplify the anatomy into sacral nerves and injuries above the sacral nerves. Injuries above the sacral nerves are actually most of the spinal cord injuries, and they all behave about the same. All of these suprasacral injuries behave about the same, and the sacral injuries have a different behavior when it comes to bladder function. You've probably heard plenty about what your level of injury means in terms of your arm or leg function, but what does it mean for your bladder function? Well, that's what we're here to talk about. First, let's cover how normal bladder function works when there is no spinal cord injury, and then we'll talk about how spinal cord injury affects the normal function. So, normally, there's a reflex, just like a knee-jerk reflex when the doctor hits someone on the knee with a hammer, a reflex that senses any urine in the bladder and causes a bladder contraction. The sensory nerves, these are S234, by the way, travel from the bladder to the sacral spinal cord, that's the part in green, and then the bladder muscle nerves travel back from the spinal cord to the bladder, completing this reflex circuit. Now, if this was all there was to urination, we'd all be peeing every 15 minutes or so, literally any time there was urine in our bladders. Instead, the brain gets involved and helps people block this urination reflex until they're ready to urinate, like when they're on the toilet. We aren't always aware of the inhibition or blockage. It's just always there. Of course, sometimes we are very aware of it, like when our bladder is full and there's no bathroom to be seen. Our brain works really hard to block that reflex contraction and keep us dry. So what happened before your spinal cord injury was that the bladder would feel a little urine in it and send a signal along the sensory nerves to the sacral spinal cord. Then a signal would come from the brain to block the contraction and allow your bladder to keep filling. 
and keep filling up with urine. That cycle would get repeated until your bladder was very full. And even when your bladder is quite full, you can continue to inhibit those contractions and not urinate until you want to. At the moment that you decide to pee, your brain would remove the inhibitory signal and allow the bladder reflex to take over, resulting in a bladder contraction and a complete emptying of the bladder. Notice how I didn't say your brain tells your bladder to pee. It just stops inhibiting the reflex cycle and the bladder pees on its own. So what happens after a spinal cord injury? Well, that depends first on whether we're talking about the first few months after the injury versus long term, and second on what level of injury there is. The first few months after the injury are a period we call spinal shock because the nervous system really doesn't know what's going on yet. Nothing below the level of a complete injury works at all, even reflexes. So your knee tendon reflex won't work and your bladder reflex won't work. See how we've got the X's drawn through both the sensation and the contraction side, so that whole bladder reflex won't work. You won't feel anything in the bladder and it won't contract to empty. So we get a situation we call urinary retention due to a weak bladder. The bladder just fills and fills and never empties. So during these first few months, you'll either have a Foley catheter in all of the time or you or your caregivers will perform intermittent catheterization where a catheter is inserted for a minute or two every few hours in order to empty the bladder. At some point, anywhere from a few weeks to several months after an injury, the spinal shock wears off and the reflexes start to come back, both the leg reflexes and the bladder reflex in the case of a suprasacral spinal cord injury. Now remember, a suprasacral spinal cord injury means a spinal cord injury anywhere above the sacral part of the spinal cord. So here, that means anywhere above the green part of the cord. This is important because the sacral part of the spinal cord controls the bladder reflex. So, if the injury is above the sacral part of the cord, then the reflex isn't damaged. What is disrupted, though, is the brain's ability to control the reflex. The nerves that normally travel down the spinal cord and allow inhibition of the bladder reflex arc are transected, and the reflex arc starts to come back. The problem is that without the brain intervening in this reflex arc, the bladder starts to do its own thing. So, you start to feel the bladder waking up. But depending on the completeness of your spinal cord injury, you'll have a pretty hard time blocking the bladder from emptying. This is what leads to unwanted bladder spasms and inconvenient urine leakage when you don't want it to happen. So you'll get some urine in the bladder, the sensation will be carried to the spinal cord, you'll get a contraction, and the bladder will empty. Sometimes it'll empty all the way, other times it'll just empty part of the way. This cycle will repeat itself. Partial fill of the bladder and then an uncontrolled urination. This is what leads to the leakage, otherwise known as incontinence, after a suprasacral spinal cord injury. With time, the nerve pathways grow and intensify, probably because they have no brain input inhibiting them. So, just like tendon reflexes can become too intense, the bladder reflexes can become too intense. You may have more and more intense bladder spasms and urinate with less and less volume in the bladder. What this means is that over time, the bladder is contracting more and more often. It's almost in a constant state of spasm, just like some people's legs after a spinal cord injury. And just like the legs, the bladder can develop a contracture where the wall gets thicker and thicker and thicker. The problem is 
that you don't want to have a thick walled bladder. The muscle buildup replaces the normal elastic tissue in the wall of the bladder, and over time, the muscle behaves more like scar tissue than like a contractile muscle. You really don't want a muscle-bound bladder. What you want is a yoga bladder, you could say. The problem is that the muscle-bound bladder can't stretch very well to hold urine at low pressures. Let's look at these two bladders, a thick-walled one on the left and a normal thin-walled one on the right. Let's pretend they are both the same size when empty, and then we put the same amount of urine in each. The instant the urine goes in, the pressure will go up in both if they stay the same size. The difference is that the flexible bladder will immediately start to relax and stretch. As the volume of the bladder increases, it will accommodate the same amount and even more urine at much lower pressures than the rigid, thick-walled, muscle-bound bladder. This high pressure in the thick-walled bladder will want to be released somehow and it will typically release through either urinary leakage out the urethra or, worse yet, backup of urine to the kidneys. This is called hydronephrosis, and it leads to kidney failure over time. In fact, this used to be a frequent cause of death in people with spinal cord injury. A complicating factor in suprasacral spinal cord injury is that many people have a spasm of the sphincter muscle, which is the valve at the bottom of the bladder. This spasm is called detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, or DSD, which is a fancy term meaning that the detrusor, or bladder muscle, and the sphincter, or valve, are dyssynergic, meaning that they are not working in coordination. Basically, a bladder spasm should be accompanied by relaxation of the sphincter muscle so you can empty your bladder under low pressures. But the DSD blocks the outflow and the high pressure gets trapped, worsening the hydronephrosis. The DSD helps explain why even though the bladder contracts after suprasacral spinal cord injury, the bladder doesn't empty all the way and we don't usually want to rely on those spasms for urination. That incomplete emptying and all the spasms can also result in lots of urinary tract infections or UTIs. Don't worry, we have lots of treatments to help bring down the pressure, avoid urinary tract infections, protect your kidneys, and keep you dry. I'll discuss those in my next video. For now, let's move on to sacral spinal cord injury and how it affects your bladder. The effects of a sacral spinal cord injury on the bladder are much easier to understand. The sacral spinal cord injury interrupts the bladder reflex arc, so no sensation or contraction can occur. This results in a bladder that can hold lots of urine without the person feeling much at all and without them being able to empty it through bladder contraction. We sometimes call this a flaccid or limp bladder. Remember in the last slide that the suprasacral spinal cord injury results in DSD, which is a spastic sphincter? Well, sacral spinal cord injury causes just the opposite. The sphincter is weak. So, as the bladder fills up, it will expand to hold more and more urine. So these people don't usually have problems with high bladder pressures or hydronephrosis. They also don't get bladder spasms causing leakage. Because of the weak sphincter though, they will have leakage with coughing, laughing, or transferring, all activities that put pressure on the bladder. So, in summary, the symptoms of neurogenic bladder, which is the bladder damage from spinal cord injury, depend a lot on where the injury is. A normal bladder should ideally fill at low pressure and have good controlled contractions to empty the urine. The sphincter should tighten during filling to keep you dry and relax during emptying. After the spinal shock phase, the complete suprasacral spinal cord injury, that is, all quadriplegics and most paraplegics, will have overactivity of both the bladder and the sphincter. The overactive bladder will result in bladder spasms with leakage of urine 
and over time may cause high pressures and hydronephrosis if not properly managed. The sphincter will also be overactive and that will worsen the ability to empty the bladder and will further raise the pressures in the bladder. The complete sacral spinal cord injury and the spinal shock phase are really similar. The bladder and sphincter will both be underactive resulting in a flaccid bladder that retains urine and a weak sphincter that results in leakage with activity. I hope this has been helpful. Please watch my next video to learn about treatments to help you control your bladder, avoid UTIs, and protect your kidneys. Thank you. Thank you.